morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Michael Falk. Uh, he is the director of FBRI, Center for Neurobiology Research, and heads up their Center on NeuroSurf program. He's a professor at FBRI and the Department of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. He received his training at VCOM and his postdoctorate training at Harvard. His research focuses on developmental neurobiology with a specific interest in vision system development, toxoplasma, synaptic development, among others. He is a recipient of numerous awards and honors, including multiple teaching awards and the Young Scientist Mentorship Award from the International Society of Neurochemistry. Please welcome Dr. Michael Fox. Thank you guys for being here. I'm not used to having to talk at 7.30 in the morning, except to my kids, so uh, this should be interesting. Such an old slide, not a single title is correct at the bottom. We, Virginia Tech has changed their logo. VTCRI is now FBRI, and my center has a new name as well, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I like to start with a demonstration uh, for those that aren't used to studying the brain. And usually I dim the lights so it's completely black, but it's 7.30 in the morning and I know that that is a dangerous situation uh, for me and for everybody else. And so uh, I'm gonna try this with the lights on. I'm not sure how it'll work, um, but uh, bear with me. To talk about how, um, how social media is very divisive and how uh, I don't even understand most of the abbreviations uh, that follow hashtags. And I use it to introduce this image. <laughs> and, and I stopped using this several years ago because it's kind of dated now, but uh, if any of you saw the top 10 images from the last decade, this was one of them. <laughs> so I thought, oh, it's a good time to bring it back out. So how many people in this, in this image see a blue and black dress? And how many people see a white and gold dress? See, it never gets old. Um, and so I use this to teach about the visual system. As somebody who's interested in the brain, this is a perfect teaching example for us to see how our brains work. And so we all actually see, detect the same image. But what we do with that uh, information in our brain is different based on our past experiences. And our past experiences here are how we view the dress. Is the dress in direct sunlight or is it in a shadow and that little bit of knowledge dictates whether you see a blue and black dress or a, a white and gold dress. And so I said this many times when this first image came out. In fact, um, Virginia Tech had me say it on the news. <laughs> uh, I did it a lot. And at the end of talking about it, I would ask people, do you believe me? And I think I was maybe 50% successful in being able to, to really get people to understand this. So I was sitting in the Charlotte airport, and I was frustrated with this lack of success. As an educator, I thought I should be doing better. And so I came up with a way to try and demonstrate this to people. So can anybody see the difference in these two dresses? They're exactly the same. They're just mirror images of each other. They're just uh, copied, copied and pasted in the Charlotte airport. Um, so in the next slide, you're not going to see the dresses. You're just going to see a screen, and right in the middle of the screen, right here, there'll be a gray dot. And this is kind of an awkward period in the talk because I'm going to have to have you focus on that gray dot for 30 long seconds. So there'll be a lot of silence, um, but just bear with me and just Keep, you can keep eating as long as you keep focusing on the gray dot. All right, so here we go, 30 seconds of silence. So what this is doing is trying to change the context of how you're going to see that dress. It's a very simple uh, experiment to, to see if we can change kind of the background, whether you saw that dress in, say, a shadow or in direct sunlight. And it really focuses, it, it requires you to really focus the whole time on that little gray dot. We're almost there. This is really just me hypnotizing you. <laughs> you can laugh, but don't stop looking at the gray dot. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, good. It works in direct sunlight. I don't have to darken the room anymore. So hopefully about visual circuits in general and try to give you some of the circuits that underlie what just happened. And then I'm going to talk very briefly about building the brain. Um, and building the brain is a complex process, and I'll tell you why I'm so interested in it. And then I'll kind of get into the weeds a little bit at the end, and I'll tell you exactly what we do to understand how we wire the brain. So when I say we're wiring the brain, it's not very different than wiring your computer. And your average computer, which now might fit in your pocket and, and masquerade as a phone, has about a, a billion or two billion or three billion wires in it, even though you can't see them. They don't look like this anymore. Um, but, but our brains are quite similar, except instead of having these um, metal connections or wires, we have cells in the brains that are wired, and these cells are electrically active cells called neurons, and they wire together by processes called either axons, which are going to send information, or dendrites at the top of each neuron uh, in green or in blue <coughs> that are going to uh, collect information. And the sites of contact between them, like right here, is called a synapse, and that synapse is a specialized chemical connection between these two neurons which kind of differentiates our brains from a computer because these synapses can be quite different, whereas connections in computers are essentially all the same. So this is the circuit that we just used to view the dress. This is a view as if you're standing on your tongue looking up at your brain. Um, so hopefully you can recognize these are the eyeballs up here. So this is the front of the brain and the back of the brain. And the eyeballs actually have a bit of your brain in them. So when you were really, really young, a portion of your brain butted off from the developing middle of the brain called the diencephalon, and it ended up migrating away from the rest of the brain, and the eyeball formed around it. And that bit of brain tissue is called the retina. Every time you go to the optometrist and they look in your eye, they're actually looking at a, a bit of your brain. And the retina detects light, so it has specialized cells ca called rods and cones which detect light. They send information through circuits to these cells in the middle, which we call inner neurons. They kind of process the information, and eventually they send that information on to the projection neurons at the bottom here called retinal ganglion cells, and I'll talk a lot about those today. And it's these cells that take all of the light-derived information you get in the retina and they send it into your brain. Now, what sort of information do they send? They don't send a white or gold dress or a blue or black dress. They send features of the visual world. So some of them might send information about color. Um, so the top example is a, just an example of how color would get into the brain. Um, they also send information about contrast. So they don't ne necessarily send a picture of the A into the brain, but they might tell you uh, the difference between the light and the black uh, at the boundaries of that A. And they might send information about movement. So they might not tell you the, that there's a fly, but they tell you that there's something moving, and they send that information into the brain. And that information ends up in the middle of the brain in a region called the thalamus, which is shown here in these blue circles, which is a relay station for sensory information to get to higher order areas of the brain. And that would be way back here in the back of the brain, the occipital lobe. This is primary visual cortex. And it's in this part of the brain that you take all those features, color, contrast, motion, and you start reassembling them. There's about 20 to 30 different features that get reassembled into a perception uh, like the dress. And it's also at that point that you start bringing in previous experiences that help shift your, your uh, perception of that image. In terms of, wow, it's moved everything. Sorry, you can't read the title. Um, in terms of building the brain, I think an interesting feature of the brain First of all, a lot of your brain is dedicated toward vision, which is why I'm so interested in it. But we dedicate space in brain towards how much something is used. And so you might not know it, but you're essentially blind in almost every part of your visual field except a really small bit part. So if you were to look in the world and kind of frame what's in focus, when I ask people to do this, and you can do it with me, people usually kind of put a frame about this big. But in reality, at arm's distance, if you just hold up your thumb, and you can all do this, and you look at your thumbnail, that's actually the only part of your visual system, your visual field, that you have 20-20 or not even 20-20 vision for me. 
everywhere else you're legally blind. And you just are really good at moving that tiny little spot around and filling in the gaps. And so your brain has a lot of information for an area this big. And that's denoted here. So this is an image of the visual field, half of it. This tiny little area would have been your thumbnail. Everything else is uh, where you're not actually, uh, where you don't have good vision. It's all peripheral vision. And this tiny little space of visual field gets the most representation in brain. So you use brain, or, or space in the brain is allocated based on use. Okay, so how do we build the brain? Um, I study really early aspects of brain development. And so for me, this next image really is striking. Um, I have kids. They're a little older than five now, <coughs> but there's no way I would ever say they act like an 18-year-old. Maybe they want to, but they don't. And yet, look, here are two brain scans of a five-year-old and an 18-year-old, and their brains are identical. For me, this is astounding, and it tells me all of the building of the brain, not maybe the using of the brain, but all of the building of the brain happens really, really early. And those are the parts of brain development that I'm really interested in. How is it that a five-year-old's brain is already assembled to the same structure and level as an 18-year-old's brain? So how does this happen? A lot of it happens uh, before birth. And so this is an image that shows kind of the progression uh, through uh, fetal development uh, that shows the major landmarks of brain development. So early on, uh, we go through a period where we're making neurons, uh, which we call neurogenesis. Um, so we make the cells. They can actually become many different types of neurons, so we then specify them into a certain type, and then they migrate a great distance from where they're born to where they're going to be used. And so this happens in the first two trimesters mainly. All of the neurons that you have, the vast majority of the neurons that you have in your skulls right now were generated when you were in your second trimester. In fact, you make too many of them, and then a whole bunch die um, during, uh, just after birth. And then once you make those neurons, you then have to put them into these circuits, the circuits that I'm interested in. And so that's a process called circuit formation or synaptogenesis, and it occurs at the end of the second trimester, the third trimester, the first few years of life. And then once you form them, you actually make way too many of them, and you refine them based on experience or activity. Um, and uh, this period goes on postnatally for uh, several years. Uh, and it usually, uh, people think of it as a critical period of our development because it's when we can reshape these connections. And so for each sensory system, we have a different critical period. So in visual systems, your critical period is until you're about seven years old. Um, now, a lot of times people ask me, like, when does, when does a synapse form in a, in a human brain and, and it really depends on the type of circuit you study. So some of our circuits develop very, very late. Your prefrontal cortex down here, uh, I think my wife would say mine probably still hasn't fully formed. Um, and so that's a, a very late forming circuit. The circuits that I'm going to talk to you about in the visual system form very early. So you can actually see right here the retina is starting to bud off and it's going to end up down here. And the connections between the retina and the brain start to form after just 50 days of gestation. So it's a really early forming circuit. Okay, so how do we study this process? Well, if I go back to that green schematic neuron, we start studying it after neurons have been born, after they've been specified, after they migrate, after they differentiate, and now they kind of look like this, and they have to find a partner. And they have to find a partner in a very complex developing brain. And so they have questions, like, where do I want to send my projections? Where do I want to send an axon to? And then once I get there, how do I pick the right cell to synapse onto? And it's even more complex than that because you have to synapse onto the right part of the right cell because where you live on a, or where a synapse is on a cell makes a big difference in the function. And so all of that process we call targeting, and we study it in the visual system, partly because I think the visual system is so uh, interesting, it's so important. I think. Clinically, it's going to be the easiest types of circuits to rebuild, but also because it's a lot easier to study because the eyes are accessible. And then you have to actually transform that connection into a functioning synapse, this special 
uh, apparatus that releases neurotransmitters from one side, what's called the presynaptic nerve terminal, to activate receptors on the postsynaptic side of postsynaptic receptor cell. This process uh, is um, very precise, and it takes a lot of uh, signaling. And if you disrupt that signaling, you actually end up with a whole host of neurodevelopmental disorders, neuropsychiatric disorders, um, like autism, like schizophrenia, like epilepsy. And so we become interested in it from those sorts of disease perspectives. So this slide really simplifies this process. And so, oh, I took it out. Oh, man. Okay. So normally there's an image of a neuron here and a mouse brain. Um, and so I'll have to do the math with you without that image. So this green neuron looks pretty simple when it's by itself. You have 100 billion of those. Remember when I said the computer, the best computers we have, you go to Best Buy and you get the most expensive computer they have, maybe it will have 8 billion connections in it, 8 billion wires, so that you would spend a lot of money for a computer with that many connections. Your brain has 100 billion neurons, and we haven't even started talking about the connections. And the image I normally show gives a rough estimate of a tiny part of one neuron to show you how many connections there are. Some of your neurons are connected to 100,000 other neurons. That's probably a large estimate, but if you took that estimate and you multiply your, that by your 100 billion neurons, you would end up with a really large number, <laughs> 10 to the 15. It's so large, I had to look up what it was called because I don't know what 10 to the 15th is. It's a quadrillion. Depends what country you're in, you're in actually. But here, it's a quadrillion. And it's, it's so far beyond trillions and billions, which are still difficult to understand, that we really can't have a concept of how many connections there would be in the brain. And so uh, I did a little bit of math. And if I allowed you to take my skull off and count my own neurons, hopefully there'd be something in there. And if I said that you would be able to count one synapse every second, it would take you a long time to count all of the connections in my brain. If I told you it would take you 32 years, you'd think, man, that is a long time to just be counting one synapse at a time every second. But it would take you 32 million years to count all of the synapses in the human brain if you could count one at a second. And so for me, that really drives home why I want to do this, because all of those connections are formed very precisely in the developing brain. All of us in this room have essentially the same large-scale projections. How do we create that during, brain, during the developing brain? How is it so efficient at making these precise connections? And so that's what my lab has been studying for, for uh, two decades now. So as I said, one place we do this is in the visual system. And um, this is now a, a picture of a mouse brain. It's not a deformed human brain. This is a mouse brain. We use mice because parts of their visual system are very similar to humans, uh, but we can take advantage of their genetics to make tools to study them. Uh, and we can really dive into kind of the circuit level analysis, which is really difficult using even the highest state imaging that we have for human brains. And so this image shows the retina here and different colored retinal ganglion cells projecting to different parts of the brain. Now, if any of you took uh, kind of an introductory neuroscience course in your training, you probably at some point heard about connections between the retina and the brain. And uh, they're vastly simplified in most textbooks. In most textbooks, these cells are just called retinal ganglion cells, and they project just to the thalamus, or maybe the thalamus in the midbrain. Uh, in fact, there's 40 different types of these cells, and they project to 40 different places in your brain. And so we've been trying to understand how does that happen? How do they project to these different places? And we focused here in the midbrain in a region called the superior colliculus. You guys have this region just like mice do. Uh, in terms of if what it does, it's important for uh, coordinating eye movements with head and neck movements. It's important for some kind of non-perceptual visual functions. And mice have those just like humans have those. And so it ends up being a good place to start studying how these projects form. So this is just an example uh, with lots of jargon of 
those circuits. So these are three different images of that part of brain, the midbrain. It's called the superior colliculus. And in red, we've labeled all retinal ganglion cell axons. And then in green, in each of the panels, are a small subset of those axons. And you can see they go to different places. Thank you. And so uh, these fancy names are just the mouse genetics, which allows us to label them. But you can see some label projections deep in the brain. Some label them very superficial. And in fact, probably the most obvious is that you have projections from both eyes going to both hemispheres of the brain, but we keep those projections separate. And so we call those the ipsilateral projections and the contralateral projections, depending on which eye they came from. And you can see in red and green down here, they're uh, in different places. And that's really important for creating binocular vision. And disruption of that uh, creates uh, diseases like amblyopia um, and, and other visual deficits. And so we have started to tackle how you create wires in the brain this precise. And so students in the lab screened for many, 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 many thousands of molecules that might be expressed in one of these zones that could drive the formation of an axon to a very specific place. And this is just one example of a layering uh, of cells that express a gene in one layer, which corresponds to this layer here. And that's shown here. So here, here are these cells. Here are those projections, a little difficult to see, from the ipsilateral eye. And here are the same cells, but projections from the contralateral eye, and they don't overlap. And so this is how we go about trying to figure out how the brain is wired. We find very specific cues that might drive the formation of a specific connection, and then we take them away. And that's what mice are really good for. And I, and I haven't mentioned it because it's not terribly important, but the gene is called nephronectin. Uh, anyone who's ever studied the kidney probably will see that this was first found in the kidney and is super important for forming nephrons. Also happens to be important in the brain, so it's not like the brain comes up with novel genes or proteins to, to build itself. It uses the same sorts of mechanisms that every other organ system uses. So how do we do this? We use mouse genetics to take away these candidates, and then we look at the wiring of the brain. And so this is kind of the the hypothesis that these cells express a factor that gets this, the wire in the right place, what happens when we take it away, and that, that's shown here. So in these top images, we have controls, and in the bottom images, we have the mutants lacking this candidate. In the right side, we have the contralateral projections, which hopefully look really similar. And in the left side, we have the ipsilateral projections, and it's a, it's a much smaller projection than the contralateral projection. And this is because, as opposed to you, where your eyes are in front, a mouse's eyes are on the side, and they have a very small window of binocular vision, whereas you guys have a much larger, about 60% of your visual field is binocular. And so that's why there's a small projection here. But it's missing in the absence of this, of this gene. Okay, so now, after probably four years of work, the student in the lab found, okay, this specific gene is important for wiring this specific type of cell. And the whole hope is that we could make a molecular map to figure out how all of the wires in this part of the brain are formed. Okay, so what? So what? Um, surprisingly, we don't actually really know in your brains why you have to have ipsilateral and contralateral projections in the colliculus. I told you it was important for binocular vision, but that's really just a theory. We don't actually have evidence in this part of the brain that that's true. But now we have a mouse that we can test this. And we can't really ask a mouse, what do you see? Uh, they, they wouldn't respond very well. But we can give them behaviors that they can do, and then we can assess uh, whether or not their vision is impaired. So it turns out we know quite a bit about what this part of brain does in terms of behaviors. And one of the behaviors is a little shocking. It's that mice actually don't just like cheese. They are actually really good hunters. And if you take away their food for 12 hours and you put them in a, in a arena with a cricket, they are avid cricket hunters. And that's actually a really difficult task visually to be able to track something and hunt it that's fast, agile, jumps, kind of taunts you a little bit. And so we can use that as a metric of vision. And so that's the, the diagram here. And in fact, if you take away binocular vision, you have impaired cricket uh, prey capture hunting. Not surprising, you need to be able to uh, binocularly focus to be able to catch something like that. In contrast, mice 
are also very fearful animals. If you ever see a mice in the house, it will go against the side of the wall. Uh, it won't be in an open space because it, it's worried about predators itself. And you can mimic this in a, in a lab test by uh, presenting a dark object over the top of a mouse and having it get bigger, as if a hawk is coming down to swoop in and catch the mouse. And the mice will immediately flee and, and kind of go into like a little tent that we provide for hiding. And in fact, we found that binocular vision isn't important for this, which is not at all surprising either because it's such a large object and it might appear on one side of the body or the other, not right in the binocular zone. And so we can use these sort of animal models to, to figure out what these circuits do. So you could say, well, now we know how mice work, great. Okay, so what else, why else might this be important? Well, it turns out at the very beginning, I said, we're interested in this circuit because as a developmental biologist and a developmental neurobiologist, one of the things you hope is that what you learn about development will be important, not just to understand the process, but so that you could reapply it in some sort of regenerative therapy in diseases. And so the National Eye Institute, which is part of the NIH, has a big initiative to try to understand how to rewire the brain because of all the, part, all the circuits in the brain, as I said, this is probably the one that's gonna get rewired the first with things like stem cell therapy. We can put stem cells into the eye very easily. We can incorporate them into the retina. We can make them into retinal ganglion cells. We can make them make axons. We just can't get their axons to go to the right part of the brain. And so we're hoping that identifying these cues will be important for that. And we, we usually talk about it in terms of glaucoma. This affects about 3 million Americans. The retinal ganglion cells are lost. Uh, there are some kind of nuanced problems with that. Glaucoma is, of course, a disease where you have an increased pressure in the eye. Uh, and that causes the cells to die, and putting new cells into an eye that has elevated pressure might not be the best situation, and nobody's come up with a solution for that yet. However, there are other diseases where these cells die, and one is a developmental disorder called optic nerve hypoplasia, and it's the number one cause of childhood blindness uh, in developed nations. And so a collaborator here at uh, the Institute and I have been studying this. There's not many people studying it, but I think it's the perfect disease to try these sorts of therapies and see if we can get regeneration of circuits uh, during development. Okay, so now I'm gonna very quickly go over some of our uh, project, one of our projects that really looks at how synapses form. And I like to use this as an example of how fundamental discoveries can lead to clinical understanding. And so we started this project not in the brain, even though I pretty much exclusively study the brain now, we started it, studied it at a synapse that forms between lower motor neurons in your spinal cord and every single skeletal muscle fiber you have. And this is called the neuromuscular junction. And this is an image of a neuromuscular junction. It wasn't actually easy to study this in mice or to identify cues that might be important for forming synapses in mice. And so we used this, probably not a household pet that you've ever seen, this is called a Torpedo Californica. It is an electric fish. You've probably all heard of an electric eel. This is more electric than an electric eel. It's about three feet. If you want one, uh, I know a diver in Monterey, California, that you can send him $300 and he'll send you one of these. They're usually tired when they arrive and they don't live very long after that. Um, but they have very large electric organs and these electric organs are uh, embryonically skeletal muscle. But rather than having all the myocytes used to form this contractile apparatus that is the, the muscle fiber, they stay as these tiny little cells, but they still get the same uh, innervation from lower motor neurons. And so that creates this, that the discharge of those neurons creates this electric field that's called the electroplac. And it's a really rich source of synaptic protein. And so we diced this up and purified lots of proteins and found lots of things that we thought would stimulate the formation of synapses. Many of these things have been studied in, in uh, diseases like autism. Um, and so we picked several of them uh, that were extracellular matrix proteins and collagens, which is kind of unusual. And we started studying what they do. And sure enough, they're important for the formation of the neuromuscular junction. I didn't say this, but the mouse neuromuscular junction, the last image kind of looked like a pretzel. And so we call it a pretzel. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we found this mutant, I called it cheese puffs because it kind of looks like cheese puffs. But the truth is your neuromuscular junctions actually look like cheese puffs already. Um, so this is actually what, what a human NMJ would look like. But there's other defects in it. 
and, and really, as I said, I wanted to study the brain, so we, we wanted to kind of ask this crazy question, which is, could the same sorts of molecules be important in the brain? Could extracellular matrix proteins, could collagens be important in the brain? And, and 15 years ago, I was sitting in my office at VCU, where I was an assistant professor, and, you know, you get a new room, a new office, and the head of, sur uh, head of neurosurgery, his buddy used to be in my office, and so he came into my office one day, he just walked in, and I was working on my computer, and he's like, who are you? And I'm like, well, I'm Mike. And we had a conversation, and he was asking me what I was doing, and I said, you know, one of our projects is looking at the role of collagens in the brain, and he offered that I could come to his surgery suite and stick my finger in somebody's skull and then tell them if there's any collagen in the brain. And I thought, okay, there's clearly a, a a, a clearly a loss of what collagens are. So many of us probably hear about collagens in fibers, tendons, connective tissue. It's totally true. They make up 20% of your weight. Uh, but that's actually a very small fraction genetically of collagens, and collagens are actually expressed all throughout the brain. And so we've looked at many of them, and one of them, this one that's underlined, collagen-19, has been really interesting to us. And you have to understand Roman numerals to study collagen. And neuroscientists are not very good at Roman numerals. So it's collagen-19. Okay, so we asked whether it's, it's important for making synapses. There's lots of different synapses in the brain. Remember, 10 to the 15th, they're not all the same. Some are excitatory, some are inhibitory, some are modulatory, some are big, some are small. And so we focused on a very specific type of synapse that forms around a cell body. So the cell body of a neuron is called a soma, and so these are called perisomatic synapses. And they're a type of inhibitory synapses, which have been implicated in all sorts of neurodevelopmental diseases and are really important for stopping or controlling the flow of information in the brain. They're very powerful inhibitory synapses. And so, sure enough, in the absence of one of these collagens, collagen-19, they, they don't form. I didn't say this, but we kind of knew that collagens were important because there's lots of collagen-related diseases, because the structure of collagen, just a single amino acid, kind of messes up the protein and causes diseases, kidney diseases, uh, liver diseases, skin diseases, uh, bone diseases. Lots of them actually have neurological consequences, and they've never been studied. And so we, we kind of went into a field knowing that we would find genes probably that, that had neurological phenotypes. Um, and sure enough, these mice have seizures, which we can record by putting electrodes in them. And they also have a battery of uh, schizophrenia-associated syndromes. You can't say a mouse is schizophrenic. It's kind of like asking a mouse what it sees. But you can do the same sorts of uh, assays on a mouse that you would perhaps do on a human to test for schizophrenia, like this bottom assay, which is the prepulse inhibition assay. That's you give a loud sound, you get a startle response. You could do it to yourselves now. It's early in the morning. You have coffee. I'm not going to do it. But if I preceded that loud noise with a small noise, you actually wouldn't have the same startle response, and unless your brain isn't wired right, and then you might respond the same. And that's what happens in schizophrenic patients, and that's what happens in these mice. And we also kind of had the clue that this gene was going to be involved in schizophrenia because there was a genomic deletion where it was lost in a family uh, with schizophrenia. But that genomic deletion was kind of large. There were three other genes. And so we didn't know for sure whether or not it would be this gene. So what's next? How do we go from electric fish to human disease? Well, we actually did identify a family that has three generations of psychiatric illness that has a very specific point mutation in this gene. And we're now trying to make mouse models of this to study what their exact point mutation uh, causes and whether it has the same sort of synaptic defects and, and physiological defects that we see. And so we're, we're uh, very excited about that. And we've also come up with uh, part of the molecule. So this is, I, I should say, this is what the molecule looks like structurally. The uh, black parts are what makes it a collagen. Those are called collagenous domains. And the orange parts are what we call non-collagenous domains, which means like anything else. It could be any other type of sequence, just not this repeating peptide, which makes a collagen. And in the mutant form, you can see you miss the vast majority of the, the protein. And it turns out this tiny little bit of protein here is what we found is sufficient to actually make synapses. So what we're really excited about is that we could make a 19 amino acid peptide and uh, take that to treat um, mice that have a lack of this uh, protein, or maybe even humans that do, 
And so I have a medical student now that's testing the uh, efficacy of that peptide uh, in vivo. We know it works if you take neurons in a dish, but everything works if you take neurons in a dish. So now she's applying it into the, the brain of control mice in mice that lack this um, collagen to see whether it can actually re-stimulate synapses. And the lack of this collagen in this family is super rare, but the disruption of this type of synapse is very widespread in neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric diseases. And so we're hoping it's, a, it's applicable to more than just people who have a mutation in collagen 19. And so that's shown here. So this is, if any of you can write really quickly, this is the 19 amino acid peptides. You could patent it and scoop me. And, but, but this is what we're hoping, is that we can make this peptide druggable. Um, and some of the challenges are this is a brain, and the brain is kind of immune privilege. It has a blood-brain barrier. And this, even though it's only a 19 amino acid fragment, that's really difficult to get into the brain. And so we're working on some chemistry to make it more uh, accessible to the brain. Of course, in mice, it doesn't matter what, what Meredith, uh, the med student, is doing, is just injecting this all over the brain and kind of making Swiss cheese of the brain, of a mouse brain. I don't think anybody will ever let us do that in humans yet. Uh, but it works perfectly well in mice, and so we'll know whether or not this peptide is, is going to be efficacious. So hopefully very quickly, with PowerPoint issues and all, I gave you a little touch of how we wire the brain. It's a slow process. It seems like you're in the weeds, but there's a quadrillion of these connections that all form very, very precisely. Our hope as a field, not just as my lab, but as a field, is that the individual processes that we find in each given part of the brain or each system, sensory system, motor system, has some sort of rule or logic that can be applied somewhere else. And that an individual discovery will actually open the door to lots of other uh, discoveries so that eventually we can make this molecular map. You, you may have heard of the Allen Brain Institute in Seattle, this uh, very well-funded institute that is mapping the expression of every cell in the brain. The Brain Initiative by the, uh, uh, by the NIH and NSF and DOD is trying to also map all the different cell types there are. And I think the next phase is going to be to map all of these connections, not only how they form, but how, they're all, how everything is wired, a process we call connectomics. And so I think this is what you'll see in the next 10 or 20 years in neuroscience and in the developing brain is very precise application of these specific circuits and the mechanisms that underlie their development, but also their dysfunction. And I just give talks now. It's really the people in my lab. Oh, they're not, they're not even in this one. So um, I came here eight years ago from VCU. I was very worried to come to Roanoke, I'll be honest, because I wasn't sure about how I would get people into my lab because it was a brand new institute. I literally put a hard hat on when I went through what used to be called BTCRI, and Mike Friedlander was like, this will be your lab when it has walls, and this is where your animals will go. And I thought, how, without any infrastructure or culture of research, how will I ever get people here uh, to do the work? And it has not at all been a problem. My students, my postdocs, my medical, my, my graduate students, my uh, medical students, even my undergrads, have been fantastic. And, uh, and so it's really been a plus to being here in Roanoke. What I thought was going to be the biggest minus has actually been one of the biggest strengths of being here. And so it's really those individuals that have made a lot of the discoveries at, in the Fraylin Biomedical Research Institute, and they deserve far more credit than us PIs. Um, so I'm happy to, this is normally where I take questions. I was told to put some questions in, but I'm going to ask you guys questions, if you have questions for me, and then I can ask you guys some questions. Yep. Um, I want you to go back and talk some more about the optic nerve hypoplasia, because as a clinician, you know, clinical stuff is what I really kind of focus on. So most optic nerve hypoplasia, it seems to be multifactorial. Uh, some optic nerve hypoplasia is um, related, there's a couple of genes that cause some forms of it, and sometimes also there's septooptic dysplasia, so the pituitary is involved, other structures in the brain. So um, can you expand a little, a little bit more about how your research intersects with optic nerve hypoplasia and what you're hoping to do? As a clinician, what I'm thinking about is that optic nerve hypoplasia is not like a single phenotype even really, and it's definitely not a single genotype. So that's a great question. Um, so, and I agree with everything you said, 
it's not at all an easy disease, and maybe this is why it hasn't been well studied. It is thought to be um, more environmentally driven than genetically driven, and I don't necessarily believe that. I, I think there's some genetic causes of it, too. Um, in fact, we've been contacted by several families that have multiple mm -hmm. generations. There are some single gene causes, like HEPX and yeah. uh, that would be So PAC6, HEPX, these are yeah. genes, they're transcription factors. In the case of PAC6, which has been implicated in optic nerve hypoplasia, it's a terrible gene to use as a model because um, mice that lack it don't have eyes. And so I guess that's a really severe form of optic nerve hypoplasia. <laughs> kind of an underdeveloped optic nerve actually happens if you don't have eyes, but it's really difficult to get at the um, mechanisms underlying it. So we came to study it um, because someone else at the institute was studying the role of a gene called CAS, which is an excellent gene that's actually more associated with autism. And there's actually a really high uh, coincidence of autism in ONH. And so we kind of got interested in it. And patients with this have um, uh, ONH, but other ocular phenotypes as well. And so we started to study it in that term, in terms of that. This gene is not a transcription factor, so it would be downstream of one of those, uh, kind of a target uh, of some of these pathways. And so we thought it might be a better tool uh, in that there would be less severe phenotypes so that we could actually learn something about the disease. Like, do the connections actually form and then degenerate, or do they just never form at all? Something that we actually never knew in, in ONH. And so we use, uh, we've generated a bunch of different models of that gene. It's kind of complicated because it's X-linked, um, as opposed to a lot of the other ones that I show. Uh, but um, so that's how we've gotten into it. And we think it's a much better model. It does have cerebellar phenotypes. Um, and um, other phenotypes as well, but cerebellar and ONH are the two biggest. But it's a, it seems like it's a much better model because the animals live, they have eyes. The connections between the retina and the brain form uh, very early, they form pretty normally. And then uh, around eye opening, we start to see, um, sorry, mice are born with their eyes closed, humans are not. <laughs> Uh, at about two weeks, mice open their eyes. That first two weeks of postnatal development in a mouse is kind of akin to third trimester development in human. So when mice are born, it's kind of like the end of the human second trimester. And so we start to see ONH in these models at kind of the end of the third trimester, kind of when birth would happen in humans. And so we're hoping this is uh, a great new tool to actually start studying some of the mechanisms. And we also hope that because it's downstream of transcription factors, that, it's, that it could be one of the targets of these environmental factors, so it's not like you're just studying one gene and what it might do. All right, thank you for the talk. It's a very ni nice talk. And um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is actually practical. We have seen, like, the coincidence that we had uh, an infant three months old last week on the floor admitted due to congenital blindness and nystagmus, which I think is most likely, as you have mentioned it, most likely due to the most common cause is Leber's uh, optic hypoplasia. It's most likely the optic nerve is involved. And Leber's is the one which is most commonly uh, known to cause this disorder, and it has a lot of genes involved in this. And people also think that it could be related to the mitochondrial disorder. I, I just want to get your thoughts on synaptogenesis and also like in relation to mitochondria, because it is, we don't, I think, looks like nobody knows what the cause is. They try CoQ10 and other things. And I don't, if you have any information about Q, CoQ10, mitochondria, and synaptogenesis, uh, that's uh, one of uh, the questions which I'd like to ask. And uh, uh, the other thing is in relation to autism. Uh, I don't know if you have any experience in you are you are doing most of your research, and which is animal based or uh, and the rats. But is there any experience on functional imaging, <clears throat> even if it's on animals? Like you know, what do you see after like trial of this gene? Is there anything that you can see on functional image? Uh, in, 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 in terms of impact of the gene therapy or other therapies, uh, uh, I mean, if there is experience on functional image. Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> so the first one, mitochondria. So the image that I have of the synapse has the synaptic vesicles 
because that's a defining feature of them. But you could ar also argue that being rich in mitochondria is also a defining feature. And in fact, retinal axons, these, the, the, retinal project, the retinal ganglion cells have special mitochondria, different than other types of synapses. So they're absolutely essential uh, for the function of synapse. I don't know whether people have a clear understanding if they play a role in the development of synapses beyond just providing energy. I would argue that they probably do. And in fact, the person whose lab is studying CASC is studying mitochondria changes in the ganglion cells now and how that might relate to ONH. Um, and so I think there's probably a lot to be learned there. But in terms of the actual people studying synaptogenesis, and uh, I don't think there's a clear link between what, what a mitochondria might contribute. Does that answer the first question? Okay, the second question was more about autism. So, uh, so when you do functional imaging with fMRI in humans or animals, your res resolving power right now is about one millimeter cubed. If you have really fancy microscopes, you can get higher than that. Um, but the higher you go, the slower the resolution is. I mean, the slower the, the time that you're getting images, and it's harder to correlate with activity, I think. In that one millimeter voxel, a cube voxel, you have something like two to three million synaptic connections. What we're missing in neuroscience is the ability to do exactly what you asked, and that's to connect functional imaging with the synaptic type imaging that we do. We need a mesoscale imaging somewhere in between so that we can actually map it. And here's why it would be really important, because when you study like these inhibitory synapses, which might not even show up as connections with diffuser tension MR imaging or something, we see a decrease in synapses in autism, but at a much higher level, if you look at connectivity with diffusion tensor imaging, functional imaging, in human patients, you might see in, in, the reports of kind of over-connectivity. So different regions of the brains are over-connected, but at a sub-scale, sub you might have under-connectivity. So it depends on the type of neurons and where you are. And I think we need a tool that allows us to either do both of those at the same time or find some happy medium to really get at, at what uh, the consequences of diseases like autism are to these synapses. Um, from an animal model perspective, we have great understanding at the micron level. And the imagers, the functional imagers, have a great understanding at the millimeter level. We just need somewhere in between to answer those questions. This is you, I guess. So unusual. I've never had to do this. So, <coughs> when are the vast majority of your neurons generated? The answer is C. Does anybody know why I didn't say all neurons? There's two areas of your brains where you do keep making new neurons. One is to send new neurons into your olfactory bulb, and the other is in the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. And it's kind of an active area of research now because people think that the generation of new neurons might be associated with the generation of new memories. And of course, from a therapeutic standpoint, if we can stimulate the generation of new neurons, it might be able to help with certain diseases. So there's a huge effort to understand adult neurogenesis. But until 1998, we used to say all neurons in the human brain are generated before birth. All right, hands if you think A. Hands if you think B. Hands if you think C. Hands if you think should have been D. <laughs> you can tell I took one out. It's C. Make neurons, move neurons, wire neurons. All right. Thank you guys for coming this morning.